I'm very glad to follow a genius because it really brings home what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how love can inspire genius. I come from a background of chemical engineering, as Bernal mentioned, where um, responsible for most of the pollution of the environment, particularly for the pollution of water, not only the quantity of pollution, but most of the most worst hazardous um, substances you find in water are designed, created by chemical engineers. And I've spent the last 10 years of my life looking to rethink, reimagine, redesign chemical processes so that we can um, not only prevent pollution at source, dramatically reduce the impact we have on water, but perhaps even have a restorative impact on water. Because Engineers, like myself, have forgotten that water is life. We've forgotten that water is essential for life. Um, not only is it part of our body, 75% of our body, 90% of our um, blood, 80% of our brain is water, but it's also um, what makes up our entire planet. And all of the organisms and all of the ecosystems um, on Earth over the last 3.85 billion years of creating um, life and, and the Earth that we, we know today and live on and rely on for life, um, have learned to do what we call in the field that I'm in now, um, which is biomimicry, they've learned to create conditions conducive to life. And how can we as engineers, um, designers of our world, bring back life into the way that we make things? And can we design systems, processes, products that continue to create conditions conducive to life? So biomimicry is, by definition, the conscious emulation of life's genius. Genius because not only are the organisms solving challenges that we really battle to solve with uh, solve, but also they do it in a way that continues to create conditions conducive to life. So what I want to do is look at one of our biggest challenges, which is how do we solve our sustainability challenges around water, and how we're looking to apply biomimicry to this particular challenge. Now, this is a place in India, it's called Lavasa, and HRK, the largest architecture firm in the world, is looking to build a city there. And they've partnered with the Biomimicry Guild to figure out how to do this in a way that is creating a restorative city, a city that doesn't just impact on the environment, but actually is beneficial to the environment. So what they do is they go out with biologists, people who study life, um, and the architects go with them, and they figure out what's the genius of this place. How do the local organisms, the local ecosystems, manage to continue create, to create conditions conducive to life here? They cycle oxygen, they cycle carbon, they keep water moving and clean, um, they sink it, they store it. How does the local ecosystem provide these services, come up for a set, with a set of standards for that, and apply those same standards to their built environment so that their city also provides ecosystem services? A whole brand new way of looking at the way we design and build. Even more detailed within the genius of place is a look to how those particular organisms in that environment go and manage water. So in Lavasa, India, they have up to nine meters of rain in the monsoon season, and you cannot manage nine meters of rain using typical stormwater management systems. So how do the local organisms and ecosystems manage that amount of rain? So here's one example of what comes out of what's called the Genius of Place report. You have the local organism there. The ant um, manages to prevent flooding of its nest by channeling water through these amazing branching systems. And what they do in the genus of place is they abstract from that some principles that they can apply to a human built environment for managing stormwater and for stinking, st sinking water back into the ground. So how can we learn from a genius of place no matter where we are around the world? And this is what we're doing a lot with Biomimicry South Africa, identifying where, where is the genius of place that we really need to learn from how do local organisms and local ecosystems manage water here, and how can we apply that to our human systems? So what I want to do now is take you through about five case studies of how particular organisms have inspired innovations around water, and how these could perhaps inspire ourselves to continue to look to nature for inspiring genius solutions around water. So that's from a place in India where they have large amounts of water, go to the desert, very little water. So creatures need to figure out how to have access to that water. And this Namibian desert beetle manages to drink from fog. So fog comes off of the ocean and it puts its back up and on its back are these tiny little bumps that are very hydrophilic, water loving. And they attract water on and condense the water on its back and those hydrophobic channels channel the water quickly into the Namib desert's mouth, enabling it to drink from fog. Now a company called Kinetic partnered with another company called Inventor, have developed a substance that mimics this, and they're enabling the capturing of water from fog, all from water vapor. 
One of the applications is for cooling towers on top of buildings. Um, cooling towers use up to 500 million litres of water um, every year. Um, and imagine how much water is lost through evaporation just to keep your building cool. Now, if you have a substance like this there that can capture anything up to 10%, maybe even more, of that water vapour and reuse it in the, in the system, recognising how important it is to keep water in our systems. Another potential loss of water is in leaking pipes. Um, if that middle image is a typical image of a piping system in a city, imagine trying to manage the leaking pipes in a city. It's very difficult to keep track of leaks. So how does your body manage to keep track of leaks in your blood system? Again, branching patterns throughout the body, very similar to the branching in, in the city. How does the body manage to, to, to quickly heal a wound or a cut, it's like a leak in a pipe? Well, patrolling your body, you have these things called platelets, and platelets quickly move into that part where there's a leak, and they seal the leak. There's a company that's called Brinker that's mimicking this in, a, in something called platelet technology. They let out these tiny little polymers through the pipe, Quickly, when there's a leak, they rush in to fill that leak, and they plug a leak like that. What's more is they have an electric charge on them, and that means that when there's an accumulation of these in the piping system, you can scan the pipe, you find where there's accumulation of charge, and you can go and fix the pipe exactly where the leak is. So there's another field of where we're looking to water for innovation, I'm uh, looking to nature for innovation, is desalination. We need access to water. A lot of countries are looking to how we can take water from seawater. Well, mangroves every day take water from seawater, and they do it using a membrane system in, their, in them, which is similar to a membrane system in our kidneys. In there are these little gates called aquaporins, and they have a very specific shape that is, is particularly suitable for channeling water through them. Now, water is shaped rather like Mickey Mouse with a big O and the little H um, hydrogen ears. Um, the O has got a negative um, charge and the, and the H has got a positive charge. So water's got a very specific electric signature. And these gates also will only allow water with that particular electric signature through them. So smaller molecules like salt with a different electric signature will not go through the pores. And what happens as water molecules get to those gates, they actually get pulled through the membrane as opposed to being pushed through the membrane. Combination of the shape and the charge pulling them through that shape. When we create reverse osmosis systems, we use a lot of energy to create a high pressure system to push the water through. Now mimicking this, two companies have found out ways to create this in membranes. They create a 70% um, saving on specific power consumption and they're five times more efficient in their reverse osmosis systems simply by mimicking the way that nature for millions of years has been desalinating water. Now one thing we want to do is learn how to keep water clean in the first place. Uh, giraffe are amazing in um, creatures that are able to eat thorns without pricking their tongues. Now how do they do that? Well on their tongues they have this very thick mucus and it's similar to the mucus on snails. Snails can go over razor blades without cutting themselves because there's no ability to make contact with that surface. Similar properties in this mucus of this giraffe's tongue. Now the University of California, California in Berkeley is looking to mimic this recipe to create lubricants that can be used in our heavy machinery. Currently we use mineral oils. So when we wash those uh, machineries, the oils end up in our water systems and oils create a lot of pollution and problems in our environment. Imagine we had life-friendly, water-based chemistry that broke down into benign constituents in our water system. And there's so many more opportunities in green chemistry for so many more functions. And I'm really moving to push this field and studying nature for green chemistry in South Africa as much as possible. And then how does nature clean water when it actually gets dirty? Well, wetlands, amazing ecosystems. There's an informal settlement near my farm that has um, a raw sewage going into a wetland. The wetland's already been broken, it's got a channel through it. The raw sewage E. coli count is close to 3,000 as it enters that. We want the E. coli count one maximum. <laughs> and when it leaves that broken wetland, it's down to 30. So water is cleaning that sewage. The wetlands are cleaning that sewage for us free of charge. No harsh chemicals added. Multiple companies looking to mimic wetlands, create constructed wetlands, the living machines by John Todd and the various communities around the world. We're looking to see how we can apply this to our own um, water treatment in South Africa. And I've just started a five-year project with the Water Research Commission looking to how we can look to nature to inspire new ways of cleaning our water and keeping it clean, not only mimicking constructive wetlands, but other potential ways from learning from nature. And one of the things that really intrigues us when we study water is the way it moves. 
Whenever you see water moving naturally um, in rivers, it's always meandering, it's always moving in this amazing spiraling vortex flow that really is essential for not only uh, preventing flooding of the river, but preventing silt deposits in the river, and also for pre preventing, uh, for actually keeping that water clean and oxygenating that water. So that vortex flow that we see in the movement of rivers, we see it every time we let water down our plug, we see that vortex flow, we see it in whirlpools, we see it even in organisms that live and grow in water. And this spiral that we see doesn't, isn't just any old spiral, it's got a very specific logarithmic growth. And it's related to the golden ratio. And many of us have heard about the golden ratio, an amazing number in nature. And I want to give you a bit of insight in how understanding this ratio could perhaps inspire new innovations and genius that are really, really amazing for us. The golden ratio is evident throughout nature. We find it evident in our own bodies. And the company called PAX has managed to mimic this exact ratio for moving fluids like air and, and water. They create fans for moving air. And this particular thing is called the PAX Lily impeller. It's not a propeller, it doesn't push water, it's an impeller, it pulls water, it sucks water. And as it starts to spin, it creates a suction rather like a tornado. And it can actually create very effective mixing in a tank. So normally if we have large water storage tanks, the water is stagnant for large periods of time, you have biofilm buildup, you have problems with the water not actually being very healthy in the end because it's sitting still. Nature likes to keep water moving like in river systems. This tiny little Pax impeller, that size, relative to the size of the water storage tank, turns, starts to spin using no more electricity than the equivalent of two light bulbs, and starts to create the suction force and a tornado generated in it that actually keeps that water mixed and keeps it healthy and keeps it oxygenated, mimicking the water flow in rivers, but also keeping that water full of life, being able to continue to feed us and be full of life for ourselves. Now that flow form is a really important flow form. It's one of the most stable flow forms we find in nature. And what is interesting is this flow form, now it looks like a donut, a torus, even looks like an apple if you look at it really closely, is very, um, it's very stable but even more stable if the two vortices that are coming up and out, the spiraling is in the logarithmic growth. Because as the, in that phi golden ratio growth, as the waves interfere with each other as they go around that loop, they interfere constructively. So what we have is this continuous implosive force that grows and builds upon itself, creating this tornado of force and power. So that the smallest amount of movement create a multiple effect, really regenerative, restorative effect. So the power of the tornado lies within water. And the pulse of life that we see within the movement of water, we see within the movement of creatures in water, we even see it in the growth of organisms that grow with water. We see it in the movement of our galaxy. That same pulse of life is in our heart, it's in our heartbeat. And our heart is in fact shaped exactly like that amazing flow form, the two um, spiraling muscles of the heart moving, um, pumping the blood in this amazing flow form, this very powerful flow form. Now what's evident in your heartbeat is you have a big beat and you have a little beat, a big beat and a little beat. And when you are in a state of peace, and love, exactly what Art was singing about just now, they found that the ratio of the big beat to the little beat is in the golden ratio. And so, as you feel that power of love and inspiration, that powerful creative force is actually created as a vortex through your bloodstream and you, it's an implosive, powerful, inspirational force of love. And what I wanted to bring that back is to bring it back to recognizing that when we are for the love of water, and we're looking for the flow in water, that we can inspire our own genius by, by taking that love that we have for water and looking at genius itself and our love of, of nature and how we can combine our inspiration of creative genius, our love of nature and the love of water to create innovative and genius solutions to our water challenges. And this quote related to music as well, neither a lofty degree of intelligence nor imagination nor both together go to the making of genius. It's love, 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 that is the soul of genius. And that's why I'm for the love of water. Mm -hmm.